Okay, purpose of preaching. Many of the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. What's God's purpose for us as human beings, for man, for woman, for humanity? This is key. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. God's purpose is to make us like Jesus. Now, this is the amazing thing, and I say this to a very mixed group. Becoming like Jesus is not a spiritual religious thing. It's about being fully human. The most fully human being who has ever walked this planet was Jesus Christ. And God's purpose is that we become like Christ. God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. 2 Corinthians 3, as the Spirit of the Lord works within us, we become more and more like Him. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, just as we are now like Adam, the man of the earth, so we will someday be like Christ. Wow! What a thing to put before people. What a thing God puts before us, that we would take on the likeness and character of His Son, Jesus Christ. To be Christ-like means to think like Jesus. To feel like Jesus. To act like Jesus. Do my messages help people to do that? Hmm, that's a good question, isn't it? When I preach, do people go out knowing that that's how I can think more like Jesus, how I can feel more like Jesus, how I can act more like Jesus? And so the object of purpose-driven preaching is to develop Christ-like conviction, Christ-like character, and Christ-like conduct. Christ-like conviction, character, and conduct. Though, we need to be very careful here, don't put the cart before the horse. What do I mean by that? This can only happen when I'm born again. It is only when I'm born again that God starts that work. And I think sometimes, and I, I'm, I was struck by Nicodemus, whose faith was inadequate. He was the best of the best. He was the greatest example, uh, humanly speaking, of someone who sought God, longed for God, but his faith was inadequate. Jesus cut right across Nicodemus quite forcefully and says, um, unless a man is born again, they cannot see the kingdom of God. In other words, Nicodemus, you're not there. You're not in the kingdom. You're, you're interested in, in God. You long for God, but you need to be born again first. And so often people put the cart before the horse. They are interested in the Jesus lifestyle. They are interested in Jesus' truth and values. But unless you're born again first, does that make sense? Okay. How does God form us into Christ's likeness? Hmm. Through circumstances. Romans 8.28. The New Testament description is, we know that in all things God works for the good, for those who love him, and are called uh, according to his purpose. And we know that, that by God's providence, circumstances will be a key way he forms Christ's likeness in us. Um, through applying, secondly, his word to our lives. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. I need to apply God's word. Now, mm, okay, that's different to just listening to God's word. It's not just about taking information, it's about applying God's word to our lives. We don't just read the word, we let the word read us. And so we come and we, we place ourselves under the authority of God's word so that God's word judges us and it shapes us and it disciplines us and it, it guides us. When we get people to look at, remember, and do God's word by the Holy Spirit, they're going to be changed. They look at, 
remember and do God's word. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. I'm speaking in my context. I think most preachers produce hearers of God's word rather than doers of God's word. Yeah? Hey, uh, I think of all the, the messages I have heard, I've heard a lot. Um, but that's different compared to how much I do of God's word. I love this story. There's, there's this guy, this is in the um, 1700s, and he was an Anglican clergyman. This is so cool. He wasn't a Christian. He was converted, get this, this is true. He was converted when he was preaching his own sermon. Wow. Yeah? And so, so I've, got, I've read his book, actually. Um, and uh, as he was preaching, the Holy Spirit suddenly applied the word he was preaching to his life. And there was a moment, he, and it, it was such a change that someone in the congregation stood up and shouted, the parson has been converted. <laughs> <laughs> We're called to be doers of God's word. Um, I think so often in, in my culture, lots of people are informed in churches, but, but fewer are transformed. So I'm, I'm thinking about the Western world. I think there, are, um, even in churches, there are lots of people who are informed, fewer are transformed. Um, George Gallup, never before in the history of the United States, this is an American example, has the gospel of Jesus Christ made such inroads while at the same time making so little difference in how people actually live. Would you agree with that? It's an interesting one, that, isn't it? Dallas Willard, uh, who has written some great books, uh, The Divine Conspiracy, great book to read, said this, We must recognise, first of all, that the aim of the popular teacher in Jesus' time was not to impart information, but to make a significant change in the lives of the hearers. Hmm. Now, that's not to say information isn't in what it is, but... Jesus wanted people's lives to be transformed. He wanted people to enter the kingdom. He didn't want to fill them with religious information. God's purpose for the Bible. Let's just have a look. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Famous verses. Um, and actually, um, these verses speak about what, what God's purpose for his word is. Um, all scripture is God-breathed. And it's a really important Greek word there. Um, is God breathed and helpful for doctrine, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness? Actually, interestingly, that uh, Paul is linking two truths about Scripture both its source, it's God breathed, or literally, God exhaled is, is the word, it's God exhaled, and is, is useful. In other words, it has power to do something. Um, and the reason it is helpful is because of its source. That's what Paul is saying there. Can you see that? Sometimes it's helpful just to be able to look at a Greek commentary or a commentary which uses Greek words. Anyway, so its usefulness is linked to its authority. But actually, when it says uh, doctrine, uh, rebuking, correcting, and training, those are not the purposes it's what it does so that the purpose is accomplished. It's a means to an end. Look at what it says. So that, this is from the um, Amplified Bible, so that the man of God might be thoroughly equipped. It's a word hina in Greek. In order that, in other words, God's word does this. Why? So that we might be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It says something about how we are equipped. That's, that's what God wants to do. He wants to change us, transform us. What is the purpose of the Bible? Um, well, it's actually maturity in ministry. That the man of God may be perfect, furnished unto all good works. Maturity in ministry. You know, God wants to equip us so that we are mature in Christ and that we can minister to him in Christ. The, uh, doctrine, reproof, correction, training in righteousness are a means to an end. Four, 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 so that we may be equipped for every good work. So the purpose of the Bible is life change, transformation, 
and maturity in ministry. It's not to make us religious, God forbid. <laughs> it's to bring the very life of God, John 10, 10, into our lives. Life change, maturity in ministry. Changing our character and changing our conduct. After, after we've been born again and brought into the kingdom. God hasn't finished with us then. That's just the start. So that he works out his character and his purposes in our lives. You see, I, already, I know far more than I do. Do you do? I think we all know far more than we do. And when we look at Jesus, Jesus was a, a do-something preacher. He was a do-something preacher. We'll look at that a little bit later. Um, D.L. Moody, the Bible was not given to increase our knowledge, but to change our lives. Knowledge is important, but ultimately God wants to change our lives. Um, let's just move on. Let's, go, let's move a little bit quicker now. The Bible is not a history book. It's a manual for life. It is a history book, okay, in a sense that it deals, the, the Bible is God's revealed word into um, the, the context of people's lives. But it is not just a history book. It's a manual for life. Uh, Jesus came to give life, not just information. And uh, implication, if I intend to be a biblical preacher, my message must always be life-oriented, not just information-oriented. That's a lecture. Now, I love that. But uh, uh, preaching is different to a Bible lecture. I'm, I'm bringing God's word, people's need together in application, so that I might enter into the very life which God died for me to, to live in. God's purpose for preaching. I think it's, it's going to be the same as God's purpose for the Bible and God's purpose for human beings. This is my job as a minister, okay? Look at these verses from Ephesians 4, and we'll start to see God's purposes for preaching. Um, what is a minister's job? To prepare God's people for works of service. That's ministry. So that the body of Christ may be built up, maturity, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, Christ's likeness. So as a preacher, in my preaching, I, I want to equip people in ministry uh, and I want to e encourage them in maturity and I want to lead them in Christ-likeness. And my preaching is going to be judged on this basis. That's how God's going to judge me, because that's my role. Um, now, there is both a corporate and personal purpose in preaching and teaching. And we're just going to spend a few minutes thinking about this. There is both a corporate and a personal purpose in preaching and teaching. I think sometimes in, in the Western world, we have privatised and personalised um, religious faith. So we, we, we see, what does God want to say? Well, it's just about my own personal and private life. Yeah? It's about my own personal morality. It's about my personal spirituality. Um, and that's true, but it, it doesn't stop there. God has everything to say about everything. So our faith is the outworking from what is within outwards to how we relate to others. Absolutely. And it affects everything. Politics, economics, justice issues. Which is why, uh, and we need to realise this as well. And when we don't, <coughs> things begin to happen very badly. Historically, that's always been the case. So, let's have some examples. Germany, um, in the late 30s, the German church. Uh, well taught, um, but they, they fail to apply God's word to society. And as a result, we've got to remember, um, Adolf Hitler was elected originally. Um, and the, the, there was a wholesale failure in the church um, to, to stand up against what Hitler was doing. And the reason was they failed to apply God's word 
to everything happening in society. Um, I think there are examples um, in, in Africa to do with tribalism. Um, and Rwanda was a, a good example. Rwanda, the, the genocide in Rwanda. Don't forget, Rwanda was a very Christian country. But what happened was, it seemed that the gospel failed to... Um, it, it, it affected people's personal lives, but it failed to um, challenge tribal loyalties. Mm -hmm. And this is what happens when you, you fail to, to let God's word have its authority over every aspect of life. Um, I see this in the West. That so often in the West we baptize Western culture unthinkingly. Um, and we assume that the, the Western culture, Western lifestyle is what Jesus wants. I'm not too sure if that's the case. So, uh, can you see what I'm saying? There is both a personal and a corporate application. God's word, people's need to gather in application. Um, uh, Tim Keller speaks a lot about how our preaching, there, in every culture there are idols. Every culture um, in, in the Western world, we have many idols. And our preaching needs to both recognize and confront those idolatries. It's a big thing of Tim Keller. That's application, not just personally, but corporately too. God's word, people's need together application. Any questions there? Have people understood that? It's a big thing, that. How does this life change happen? Application. I think the result of applicationless preaching is, is perhaps all around us. Um, I, I just love those verses from Isaiah 55, verse 11. My, fa my grandfather, um, who, who died now, he had a dementia. My, my father has dementia. But I can remember the last conversation I had with my grandfather, um, who was suffering from dementia. But he remembered those verses from Isaiah 55, 11. You know, God's word will not return void. Mm. I always remember that conversation uh, with him. It, it will accomplish what I desire, that's what it says. And the problem is sometimes, though, when someone does preach, it does seem that it does return void. And, and maybe we have to be honest enough to say, as a preacher, am I guilty of that? Is that the reason? I don't know. We, we need to be honest about that. Uh, and we need to reassess our preaching if it is returning void. Though sometimes, actually, God does call us into a situation like the prophet Jeremiah. Hey, listen, you look at Jeremiah, um, and Jeremiah was called to preach. Did many people respond? No. So actually, sometimes God does call us to preach in difficult situations, and we are to be faithful and true, and that's, that's what God calls us to do. And uh, his preaching uh, was, was a, a way of bringing God's judgment on Israel. And hey, you've got to think about Jeremiah. The, the commitment that took, where he saw nothing. Could you just imagine God's well done to Jeremiah when he entered heaven? You, I just think, you wonder whether um, God made it up to Jeremiah. There, the Bible does talk about rewards for faithful ministry. And you just think that after a lifetime of faithfulness without seeing any fruit, when Jeremiah entered into God's kingdom, um, through Jesus, by the way, that's a, that's a, we could talk about that, but through Christ, you know, he, he got a real well done. Sometimes we're called to be faithful preachers of God's word, even in difficult situations.